Good evening, everyone. It is my uh, great pleasure to welcome you to the LSE this evening. My name is Aaron Reeves. I'm an Associate Professorial Research Fellow in the International Inequalities Institute here at the LSE. And it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce tonight's public lecture. This event is sponsored by both the International Inequalities Institute and a very generous donation from the Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Uh, it's a, the, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation has funded a program of work around the relationship between poverty and inequality, and part of that work is actually now available online as part of the CASE website, so if you're interested in those questions, there are a number of compelling and interesting working papers up uh, available. But the money that the Joseph Roundtree Foundation have offered also sponsors a series of lectures and events, and this is the latest uh, in that series. We're therefore thrilled this evening to have with us Professor Walter Scheidel, who is Dickerson Professor in the Humanities and Professor of Classics and History in the Department of Classics at Stanford University. And he is also this year currently a fellow on the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. This evening, Professor Scheidel will be talking about his latest book, The Great Leveller, Violence and the History of Inequality from the Stone Age to the 21st Century, and also uh, with the title this evening, Into the Future as well. The hashtag for this evening's lecture is LSE Scheidel, and, it is, and tonight's lecture is being recorded. And so if you are tweeting, we would love that, but also would ask you to put your phone on silent so that we can avoid any embarrassing ringtones that might be uh, emitting from your phone at some point during the evening. We're going to have lots of time for questions uh, later on um, in the evening, and there are also copies of the book available uh, to buy afterwards. And if you haven't done so already, I would really highly recommend you take the opportunity to, to buy it and perhaps maybe even ask Professor Scheidel to sign it for you as well. So late last year, I was fortunate enough to read an early version uh, of the book, a pre-publication uh, version, and it struck me immediately as a, a brilliant, provocative, and indispensable contribution to our understanding of, of inequality over the long and the short run. And despite being grounded in economic history, a discipline that's not my own, it is a book that asks serious questions about the future of inequality and the shape and structure of our societies. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to welcome Professor Scheidel to the LSE this evening and hope that you'll join me in welcoming him as he gives his lecture. Well, thank you very much for this kind invitation. Um, in case you don't want to buy the book, you will get a, a 45 minute summary, but maybe that will whet um, your appetite. It's displayed here. So um, so what I'm going to do is give you a very short digest of some of the, the principal dynamics of the evolution of economic inequality. There are obviously many different types of inequality we could talk about, but I'm going to limit myself uh, to income and wealth inequality, and in particular to one question, which is have there been factors across the full sweep of history that have reliably reduced economic inequality? And how do they compare uh, to other variables? My argument on a single slide is that regardless of where you look, the 20th century, the more distant past, Europe, Asia, you name it, um, violence, violent upheavals have been the single most important means of leveling wealth and income inequality in human history. It doesn't mean that there aren't any, that there aren't alternative factors available, and I will look at that in about half an hour, but uh, very broadly speaking, uh, violent disturbances uh, are often uh, associated with the death of tens of millions of people have been by far the most effective uh, means of reducing economic inequality. Those uh, leveling uh, forces have come in four different flavors. This is why I use the, the simile of the four horsemen of the apocalypse of the revelation of John on the cover of the book, which you can't really quite see. Um, they just happen to be four. Uh, that's why I picked uh, this image. They are listed here, mass mobilization warfare, transformative revolution, state collapse, and very severe epidemics. Now, of those four, the last two 
are the ones that have, that used to be uh, the most common ones historically. So for most of human history, prior to the 20th century, it was really state collapse and epidemics uh, that drove down inequality. Now, before I get to this, I should probably spend one minute uh, on a cognate question. Why is there economic inequality to begin with? The very short version, of course, is that if you go back far enough in time uh, to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, there wasn't a great deal of economic inequality at the time. For any number of reasons, uh, output uh, is very limited. There are simply aren't all that many material goods that could have been uh, starkly unevenly distributed. Uh, hunter-gatherers are often uh, um, uh, migratory, they are not sedentary, so if they had accumulated lots of possessions, they would have had to uh, uh, carry them around with them, which would have been rather difficult because there weren't domesticated animals either to help them do it. And uh, if you look at contemporary surviving uh, foraging populations in some remote part of, uh, parts of the world, uh, you see there also, uh, you see the lack of institutions uh, that would support uh, desequalization. And it's really with the big transition about 10,000 years ago, depending on which part of the world you're looking at, to the domestication uh, of crops, of livestock, and of people, uh, in a sense, uh, with sedentism, uh, the development of the notion of property rights, and eventually of, of political institutions that you see uh, not just the potential, but the realized potential of ever-growing economic inequality. So in that sense, we can treat uh, income and wealth inequality essentially as a given, as a default condition of human history. And then the big question becomes, well, if this is something we observe in all societies we have records for uh, to varying degrees, what are the forces that uh, could reduce uh, uh, high levels of inequality? And as I said um, just a minute ago, for most of history, it's really state collapse and pandemics that used to be the most effective means of leveling. And in both cases, that is, I think, uh, quite easy to understand. State collapse is simply the flip side of state uh, formation. If you look at thousands of years of human history, um, most people lived in societies that were governed by states that were more or less openly uh, predatory, uh, hierarchical, stratified, unfair, exploitative, existed uh, to a large extent for the benefit of a small uh, ruling class at the expense of pretty much everybody else. And so the longer these states lasted, the bigger they became uh, in the form of pre modern empires in particular, uh, the more potential there was for the concentration of income and especially wealth uh, uh, among the, uh, uh, a small uh, ruling class. Now, if that is the case, and that can be uh, well established uh, as, as far back as the Roman Empire, you can, for instance, show that in the Roman period, uh, the rich got richer much faster uh, than the Roman Empire grew in terms of the size of its economy uh, or the number of people. You can actually s witness this process uh, of concentration already 2,000 years ago. And the same is true of Chinese dynasties, uh, any number of later societies. If that is the case, then if state formation is reversed, uh, that opens up an opportunity uh, for equalization. Um, because in this case, what happens is that if uh, state structures are dismantled, everybody's going to suffer uh, on these occasions. State collapse is not fun uh, for anybody, but the rich simply have more to lose. If you're a subsistence farmer and you lose more than a small fraction of your income, you're probably going to starve to death unless you find uh, some way of moving away. If you're very rich, you can lose 99% of your income and your wealth, and you're still going to be around. So for purely mathematical reasons, there is greater potential at the very top uh, for uh, a, a compression. And so overall, everybody may have ended up being poorer as a result of state collapse in history, but the rich simply had much more to lose. There are many examples I don't want to take you through. If you think of the end of uh, Bronze Age Greeks uh, 3,200 3, years ago, uh, the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, the end of the classic Maya civilization, various Chinese dynasties, the fall of Angkor, uh, if you go to Cambodia now, uh, you can see a very dramatic uh, event that effectively destroyed societies, but in the process uh, leveled as a side effect. The most recent example, in fact, happens to be uh, Somalia, uh, 
Uh, Somalia effectively fell apart about a generation ago. And while we always think of Somalia, and rightly so, of the anarchic conditions there as being very disadvantageous, it seems that the previous kleptocratic regime uh, was so bad that at least inequality in Somalia has gone down as a result of the dismantling of centralized uh, government. Uh, it's a very um, un, un, unappealing situation, but it tends to have uh, this particular effect. I just wanted to show you one example, uh, because I often get the question, well, how is it even possible to talk about economic inequality uh, prior to the modern period? What kind of evidence is there? What kind of data uh, do we have in order to draw conclusions? And often we have to rely on proxy data. There are no modern style statistics available, but there is material out there that can be quantified, that can be interpreted in a meaningful way. Uh, this is an example, since we are in fact in Britain, I guess I picked this one here, uh, for the, uh, the Gini coefficient, the standard metric uh, of inequality. Uh, in this case, not for personal fortunes, because we don't know what they were like, but for houses, uh, for houses that were uh, um, for private uh, dwellings, we can compare the degree of inequality, the degree of variation in house size in Britain before, during, and after uh, the Roman occupation. Before the Romans showed up, uh, everybody in, in Celtic Britain seems to have lived in dwellings that were more or less the same. They were quite modest in size, and there wasn't a great deal of variation. Once the Romans come in, uh, you get a much bigger spread. All of a sudden, there are few people who have large mansions uh, and villas, whereas other people live in hovels. And when the Romans uh, retreat in the 5th century AD, you go back to pretty much the way it was before with the Angles uh, and Saxons and so on. Everybody's poorer than before on average, but there's also uh, less inequality. And I could show you many more examples drawn, especially from the archaeological record. As for the second uh, main pre-modern leveling force, that is pandemics, very severe uh, outbreaks of epidemic uh, disease a few times uh, in history, most famously, of course, the Black Death that killed about half of all people in Britain in the late uh, Middle Ages, maybe a third of all people in Europe. Uh, the pandemics in the New World introduced by the Europeans after 1492 uh, that introduce uh, smallpox and measles and influenza and other uh, uh, new diseases to the, the new world, decimating the local population. And there was an early appearance of bubonic plague as well at the end of antiquity. And what happens on all these uh, occasions is that inequality goes down. And again, this is quite easy to understand. Uh, as for the Black Death, the best data uh, by far come from, from Britain, uh, from England, in fact, uh, this shows you the distribution of uh, rural real incomes, uh, the wages, or effectively it's a proxy of living standards uh, of farm laborers in England before, during, and after uh, the Black Death. And what happens is that so many people die uh, that uh, the value of labor goes up quite dramatically. If you remove half of the population without destroying the physical infrastructure, you still have the same amount of land, the same amount of capital stock, but only half as many workers as before. Well, that is going to drive up uh, the price of labor. Workers will be better able, able to bargain uh, with employers. And at the same time, returns on capital, on land and other forms of capital, are going to go down. So in this case, the poor are going to be less poor and the rich are going to be less rich. And in uh, overall, you observe a massive compression. This makes a real difference. If you live at bare subsistence level, as people did in the high middle ages, and your real income goes up uh, about 150%, that is really going to change the way uh, you live. And we can see people can just make more money. They would have a better diet, better clothing, better housing. They were generally much better off than before, whereas people in the nobility, the lords, actually had to cut back because their income streams uh, were negatively affected by this. And of course, eventually around 1500, the plague goes away, population recovers. It's a simple Malthusian uh, model, and everything eventually goes back uh, to normal, at least uh, 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 before the uh, Industrial uh, Revolution set in. Now, this technically is not a measure. This is an indirect uh, measure uh, of inequality. It's only been very recent, in very recent years, uh, that uh, researchers in Italy, in particular, have started looking at city archives. Uh, we have uh, tax archives in cities in Tuscany, 
uh, in Piemonte, in Venice, in Naples, uh, all over Italy at this point, going back in some cases to the Middle Ages, high late Middle Ages, uh, where people, uh, citizens of individual cities were assessed, uh, their private wealth was assessed so it could be taxed uh, accordingly. And if you look at these records systematically, what you see is a major uh, reduction in wealth inequality, a deconcentration in private wealth holdings at exactly the same time uh, during the Black Death. Uh, so in this case, it's the Gini coefficient or the, the share of all wealth owned by the richest 5% in this particular population. Uh, these metrics are very high before the Black Death appears. They plummet quite considerably during the Black Death and when the plague goes away and the population recovers, inequality recovers also. This is work in progress, but uh, the more these researchers look at these data sets, the more supporting evidence they discover in favor of this model. Uh, this is also uh, very recent, something published only five years ago. The first data set we have regarding real incomes in uh, the New World, in the Mexico City area in central Mexico. What happened when so many people died after the Spanish conquests? Well, what happened was uh, that real wages went up several hundred percent if these data can be trusted in response to extreme labor scarcity. Initially in the 16th century, uh, the conquistadores tried to force people to work for low wages, but eventually uh, that just doesn't really work. There's a limit to uh, what you can do if there's a profound shortage of labor. You eventually have to pay people uh, according to what the market uh, will bear, and that's what you see in the 17th century. So the same effect you get in Britain and other parts of Europe after the Black Death you can observe in the New World a couple centuries later. And one more example, uh, the earliest one we have uh, attracts uh, real incomes, again, of unskilled workers in Egypt, where we have documents going back into the pre-Christian period, and where for about a thousand years, if you're an unskilled farm worker, uh, you get paid just enough uh, to get by. Uh, so you don't starve to death, you can work a certain number of hours a day, but that's about it. And then uh, bubonic plague shows up for the first time in the sixth century, uh, kills lots and lots of people, and as a result, real incomes of these workers, uh, they go up about 150%, so just like uh, during the Black Death in the late Middle Ages, and the plague goes away and real wages go back down. So this is obviously not a very appealing kind of mechanism because tens of millions of people lose their lives in those epidemics, but for the survivors, they happen to be better off, but only for as long as these plagues are active and once their um, after effects begin to wear off, uh, you go back uh, to normal, which in this case is pretty high levels of economic um, inequality. Now all this has changed uh, only with the onset of modernity, once you get industrialized uh, economies and modern nation states, uh, two other very closely related violent leveling factors uh, take over in a way, state collapse and pandemics recede, and what you get instead in the first half of the 20th century, uh, mass mobilization warfare, World War I, World War II, and closely related transformative revolution, i.e. Uh, Lenin and Stalin in, in the Soviet Union, Mao in China, which of course are direct uh, products in a way of World War I and World War II. Here of course we have an abundance uh, of statistical evidence. Um, I'll only show you a few examples. Uh, this chart shows uh, the, uh, the share of, all of total national income in four different countries, America, France, Canada and Japan, earned by the highest earning 1% of the population. You can see that even during the Great Depression uh, in the mid-1930s, uh, the famous 1% earned close to 20% of all income in those different countries. And then it was exactly during World War II, a very short period of time, just a few years, where their share in overall income uh, collapses, uh, in some cases by two-thirds, uh, as was the case in Japan. And then from the end of World War II onwards, for about a generation, uh, you get a remarkable degree of stability, a new equilibrium where the top income share is much, much lower than it, uh, than it used to be before these locations of World War II. Yeah, other countries uh, with similar kind of data sets. 
Sometimes it works better for World War I, as in the case of Britain, where the effect of World War I is much more powerful than it was in many other countries. But regardless of which countries you look at, uh, you see this effect uh, quite clearly in the data. This is also true uh, if you look at the concentration of wealth rather than income. In this case, we have data sets that in some cases go back several hundred years because um, assessing and taxing wealth was much easier in the past than assessing and taxing income, which is for the most part a fairly modern phenomenon. And what you see here in many countries, uh, this is the, the share of total private wealth in different countries owned by the richest 1% of the population. And you can see that in the 17th, 18th, 19th century, uh, where we have data, uh, the, the richest 1% owned a large share of all uh, private wealth, most famously or infamously uh, in England right before World War I. The richest 1% owned 70% of all private wealth. So there wasn't all that much wealth left uh, for anybody else. What you also see, of course, is a dramatic uh, compression right after the beginning of World War I uh, for a couple of generations between the 1910s and the 1970s, uh, a major deconcentration of private wealth for all the countries we have data for. And then more recently, uh, the last three or four decades, a slight reversal and recovery of private wealth concentration. Now the question is, how was this affected uh, by the dislocation of the world wars? Short answer is many different uh, factors, many different variables came together in different configurations depending on which country you're looking at. But by and large, uh, this is a sort of a, a generic uh, summary. As, as Piketty has shown in his book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, uh, to a, a large extent this compression was a capital uh, phenomenon uh, that capital holdings uh, lost value, that returns on capital uh, went down dramatically as a result of state intervention uh, in the private sector uh, associated with the war effort, disruption of international uh, flows of capital, trade, investment, and so on. Any number of war-related effects that really uh, uh, contain uh, capital income returns on capital. At the same time, uh, the belligerent states had to raise taxes uh, on income and wealth to very high levels in order to pay uh, for the war effort. You get tax rates, marginal tax rates uh, for high earners and very rich people, extremely high, in excess of 90% uh, for income, 70% for large estates in the US and similar rates uh, in Britain, in France, in Japan, uh, all over the place. This effectively results in a redistribution of resources from the rich uh, to workers. You get full employment because of conscription, uh, war industry, and so on. The money ends up uh, in the, uh, primarily in the pockets of the working population. You also see, uh, wherever we have data, decline in what is known as the skill premium, the return on higher, uh, more advanced forms of education relative to those uh, with only basic uh, schooling, high school uh, uh, degrees, uh, university uh, diplomas, that sort of thing. It also happens during World War I and World War II because all of a sudden there's much more, disproportionately more demand uh, for unskilled labor. In many countries, not in Britain and the US, but in pretty much all other countries that are involved in these wars, there's massive inflation already during, especially right after the wars, because governments print a lot of money uh, to pay for the war that wipes out uh, deposits, all kinds of uh, uh, assets. And again, in many countries, there is obviously massive physical uh, destruction uh, that kills lots of people, but in terms of capital, it disproportionately affects the rich because they're the ones most likely to own housing stock, factories, ships, all kinds of things that get destroyed, uh, usually without compensation. So it depends on what country you are in. Uh, some combination of these factors is going to apply pretty much regardless where you are in Europe, in North America, uh, in East Asia in this period. Uh, just to illustrate uh, uh, some of the things I just talked about, I just want to show you two slides. Uh, this is uh, the evolution of uh, top tax rates on income in blue and on inheritances on estates in orange in 20 different uh, developed countries over the course of 200 years. And you can see the 19th century top tax rates are so small by modern standards you can barely see them. They barely rise above uh, the x-axis. There is a huge upturn during World War I, a slump uh, partially in the interwar period, and another peak 
uh, around in, in the early 1940s, uh, same date on 1945. And ever since 1945, if you average out uh, top marginal tax rates across different countries, they have been sliding down continuously ever since. So this is not just a phenomenon of you know, Reagan and Thatch in the 1980s, uh, although it accelerates in this period. It already starts right uh, when the war is over, as you can see very clearly just by eyeballing this, uh, just how crucial uh, uh, war-related um, dislocations were in this case. That in addition, you get second order uh, effects that are rooted meaningfully in the dislocations of World War I and especially World War II. There's a big push uh, for formal democratization, extension of voting rights right after World War I, in the case of Britain, uh, 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 after World War II and many other countries. An enormous increase in uh, labor union density. Of course, there had been trade unions already in the late 19th century, but they were just not very important in terms of the percentage of the workforce uh, organized in this way. This changes dramatically as a result, again, of World War I and World War II. Uh, here in, in red, you see uh, the, the percentage of the workforce organized in labor unions averaged across 10 OECD countries, very low uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, an enormous increase right during and rough, right after World War I, uh, a, part, a partial uh, retreat in the interwar period, and then another massive increase during the Great Depression and uh, in World War II. So on average, union density, in fact, in those countries peaks around 1945 and has been going down pretty much um, ever since. There are very few exceptions, some Scandinavian countries, where you get sustained increases in the more recent past. And then, of course, the welfare state. Uh, welfare state is rooted in a great many uh, different developments, but it is meaningfully based, of course, also on uh, the wartime experience. Uh, for the first time, states are capable of taxing on a much uh, larger scale. And when the war is over, uh, the government spending shifts from paying for the war effort uh, to what we now uh, would define as the welfare state, again, famously in Britain, but really all over uh, uh, the globe in all those countries that had been involved in the war. And the last factor, this is much more difficult to measure, but there is, again, a, a growing body of research on this. Um, the war uh, experience does affect people's attitudes uh, and preferences, uh, and it seems to have engendered a, a greater amount of social solidarity that didn't necessarily last forever, but was certainly quite powerful uh, during the post-war decades. So if you take all these various things together, it's actually very easy to understand why you would observe a major compression in, in, in economic inequality uh, in exactly this period. Now, as a pre-modern historian, I have to ask, are there earlier instances of leveling associated with mass mobilization warfare? Very short answer is hardly ever because mass mobilization warfare is primarily a phenomenon of the 20th century that wasn't really possible in quite the same way in pre-industrial societies, in societies not yet organized as nation states. What about civil wars? Luckily, civil wars are very rare in developed countries. Most recent example in Europe, other than Yugoslavia, is the Spanish Civil War in the 1930s, where you can, in fact, see uh, leveling and reduction in economic inequality, both during the war and in the aftermath of that war, despite the fact that Franco and the fascists won. Uh, even so, you see uh, these leveling effects. Now, more recently, civil wars, of course, are primarily uh, confined to developing countries. Uh, there's an abundance uh, of evidence. And here we see, at least on average, there's a great deal of variation, but if you average it out over uh, a large number of developing countries over the last 50, 60 years, you see that civil war tends to have the opposite effect. If anything, it would increase rather than reduce inequality uh, for the reasons that are list here. Uh, civil wars often benefit a small a group of well-positioned people um, who, who make uh, gains. They can't be taxed because of the uh, uh, weakening of state uh, institutions, state authority. Uh, the poor may suffer disproportionately. And generally in history, there are lots of, I mean, history consists mostly uh, of wars. If you open any history textbook, it's all about some war or another. 99 plus percent of wars in history do not have a compressive effect on economic inequality. It really took the very special circumstances of the 20th century to make this happen in the context of mass mobilization warfare. As for transformative revolution, I don't have to go uh, into detail. This is perfectly well known. Once you have 
a communist um, uh, takeover in Russia, in China, in Vietnam, in Cuba, in a number of places. A lot of violence uh, is going to be exercised and as a consequence there will be massive leveling of inequality. Once you expropriate the rich, often killing them in the process, once you nationalize all land, all industry, you have a planned economy where the government sets all prices and wages, well there won't be a great deal of wealth inequality left. And income inequality is going to be a function of government uh, uh, policies and uh, attested rates in the Soviet Union, in Maoist China, were really very, very low. The same is true of the various satellite regimes uh, that we have data for. Of course, that's a phenomenon that lasts only for as long as these regimes are effectively in place. Uh, income inequality in Russia doubled, uh, if you look at the Gini coefficient, doubled during a matter of just a few years after 1991. In China, the process took a little longer. Uh, the Gini coefficient for income doubles in the course of about 20, 30 years uh, following the liberalizing uh, reforms of the 1980s and 90s. So you need hardcore uh, communist regimes in place in order to contain uh, inequality in this particularly striking way. Uh, the earlier cases of uh, leveling by means of revolution, once again, the answer is well, not really because pre-1917 revolutions are not nearly as dramatic, not as uh, uh, penetrating, uh, if you will, than the communist revolutions you get in the 20th century. French Revolution, of course, is quite uh, famous in the late 18th century. There is a, a, a certain amount of expropriation going on. Nobles lose their heads and their estates. The church is being uh, expropriated. There are some land redistribution programs in the revolutionary period, but everything happens on a much less dramatic scale than what you see in Russia, in China, in the 20th century. There is arguably some measurable effect uh, if you compare uh, income shares in France before and after the uh, revolutionary and Napoleonic period. The rich are a little less rich, the poor are a little less poor than they were before. So there is some uh, uh, equalizing impact, but it's nothing like what you see in communist regimes. And if you go back even farther in time, there aren't really any successful revolutionary movements that would have suppressed economic inequality, because usually the rich and powerful would win and uh, maintain the status quo. Now at this point, the big question, of course, is are there peaceful alternatives, uh, factors that are not rooted in massive violent dislocations that had, historically speaking, uh, a similar effect on economic inequality? So even if you buy, I think we have to at this point, uh, buy uh, uh, the argument there's so much evidence for mass mobilization warfare, revolutions, plague, state collapse, they really did greatly uh, reduce economic inequality, but it doesn't automatically mean there are no alternatives out there, or at the very least, in order to make my case, I had to look, I had to really search for uh, potential uh, peaceful alternatives. Now, historically speaking, if you look at history in the long run, looking at pre-modern societies in particular, one of the key variables that uh, determines the extent of inequality in a given society is who controls the land, right? If most people uh, live on the land, farm the land, who is in control of the land is a very important uh, uh, determinant, as I said, of inequality. And there are many, many, I mean, I, I couldn't count them, probably hundreds of more or less peaceful land reform schemes, uh, programs uh, in history. But if you look at them systematically, what you see is the more orderly they are, the more peaceful they are, the less violent they are, the less well they work in terms of producing uh, equalizing outcomes. There are great many ways in which entrenched wealth elites uh, can manipulate uh, land reforms and after a while end up being in the same position as they were before. A very uh, popular uh, uh, a means is to hand out uh, land to poor uh, farmers who are not necessarily prepared uh, to farm on their own. They go into debt and the rich swoop in, buy up the land in order to uh, get the peasants out of their debt and end up with the land they already owned before. Uh, if you have schemes where the rich are being compensated in the process of land reform, sometimes they get richer than they were before because they make good use of these compensation schemes. 
On the other side, the more violent uh, land reforms were historically, and this goes back all the way to antiquity, the more equalizing they tend to be. It doesn't necessarily have to be actual violence that's being um, um, exercised. As long as there's a credible threat of violence, that by itself can have an equalizing um, effect. If you think of uh, Latin American land reforms after uh, uh, Fidel took over Cuba in the 60s and 70s, all of a sudden regimes all over Latin America felt, well, maybe this could happen here too. Maybe we should do something about this. And there was uh, American support for this funding, uh, uh, know-how, infrastructure, and so on. So there are cases where also the th a credible threat of violence uh, leads to equalizing outcomes. But the more you take violence out of the story, the more peaceful these land reforms are, the less well they work. Uh, what about financial crises? Um, People have now looked at over 100 macroeconomic and financial crises in different countries going back over 100 years, seeing, uh, trying to figure out where they had a systematic uh, effect on uh, economic inequality and the distribution of income and wealth. And the answer is not really. There's a great deal of variation. There is no consistently uh, equalizing effect of economic crises. If you think back, uh, a decade to the great financial crisis of 2007, 2008. In the US, in the UK, many developed countries, for a few years, uh, the richest were less rich relative to the rest of the population than they had been before because they were exposed through the investments uh, uh, to markets that really took uh, a dive. Within three, four, five years, uh, their position had been uh, restored. So these uh, economic crises, that are not violent in nature, don't usually have a, a, a substantially equalizing effect on the distribution of income and wealth. A partial exception is the Great Depression in the US that was unusually severe. It doesn't, didn't really play out in, in quite the same way in other industrialized nations where you have 25% unemployment. And coupled with the New Deal legislation uh, of Roosevelt, you can see some uh, mitigating effect on income and wealth equality, uh, but not uh, on a really large scale. As even in the US, it's mostly World War II that made the biggest difference. What about democracy? You might think that the more democratic societies become, the more democratic their political systems become, the less inequality there should be. Well, it turns out, if you look at the effects of democracy on economic inequality globally across a really large sample of countries over a longer period of time, you will not find a consistent effect, which may come as a bit of a surprise. The reason is there are so many different types of democracy, two-party system, multi-party systems, captured democracies, uh, any number of things, any number of, of confounding uh, variables. But that's uh, true not just uh, in, in the recent past. If you go back in, in Western countries 100 years, uh, 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 democratizing, formally democratizing reforms do not in and of themselves uh, reduce economic inequality. So that, unfortunately, is not really uh, an all-purpose solution either. It is true that union, labor union density, uh, the percentage of the workforce organized in, in trade unions, that is meaningfully related to economic inequality. The larger the share of the workforce in unions, the lower uh, inequality is going to be if you control uh, for other variables. That's certainly true, but as I tried to show you earlier, unionization is not uh, a, a genuinely peaceful alternative um, uh, force because it was very heavily mediated by the violent shocks of World War I and World War II. So you can't really treat it as a genuinely independent factor. Uh, that leaves us with two other uh, possible candidates for peaceful equalization. One, of course, famously is the idea that economic development will, on its own, if you just wait long enough, uh, make societies more equal. As uh, societies uh, develop, as they mature, as people move from the agrarian sector into the industrial and urban sector, uh, initially inequality is going to go up. And then as everybody ends up, or most people end up, in higher skilled, higher paying uh, urban jobs, industry, service sector, uh, that is going to uh, reduce inequality overall. An idea uh, famously, of course, associated with uh, Simon Kuznets, who came up with this first in the 1950s, got a Nobel Prize for it in the 1970s, and it certainly fit what people could observe in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. There was strong economic growth all over Western Europe, North America, East Asia, 
and inequality was either low or going down at the same time. Well, all this really stopped about 40 years ago, and we now know empirically that's just unfortunately not true. You can have ongoing economic growth, and inequality can move either way. And it has been going up in most developed countries in the last 30 or 40 years, e even as uh, economies have matured further. So it doesn't really seem to work either. Last candidate, of course, is um, the provision of education, the idea being there's a race between education and technology. Technology changes all the time, and the provision of education, of training, of skills has to keep up in order to prevent uh, some people who just happen to have the right skills of benefiting disproportionately, which then in turn drives up wage inequality in particular. And it's certainly true, broadly speaking, that there is a meaningful uh, connection between how well societies are doing in terms of uh, training, uh, educating people, and overall levels of inequality. It's certainly true that if our education systems were less inclusive than they are, inequality would be higher still. But if you look at the actual data, it is striking that even this is very heavily mediated by these violent shocks. If you look at the data for the United States, 100% uh, of the reduction in skill premiums in the US from 1900 uh, to the present day took place during World War I and World War II. So the compression between an income between people who had a basic education and who had high school degrees or uh, university college degrees, uh, whenever this, this, uh, this gap was reduced, uh, this took place uh, at times of massive violent conflict. Zero percent uh, of the reduction took place before World War I, during uh, the interwar period, or since World War II. So even uh, these effects are very strongly mediated, as I said, uh, by violent conflict. So unfortunately, it seems that maybe there are other peaceful alternatives out there that I haven't thought of, but if you look at all these uh, much discussed uh, factors, they don't really work quite as well if they work at all consistently as violent leveling mechanisms. And in as much as they do work, they work because there is actually uh, some form of violent dislocation uh, sort of lurking in the background, driving uh, of these uh, various developments. So they are not generally peaceful in that sense. So it seems that we can, if you want to be a little re reductive, uh, we can say that by and large, if you look at world history in general, there has been an interplay over hundreds of thousands of years between different processes of wealth and income concentrations. So the sources of inequality, I should say, have changed quite a lot over time. If you go back thousands of years, uh, openly predatory behavior would have been much more important, uh, being able to coerce people, uh, uh, doing things they don't really want to do, and that would create uh, inequalities. More recently, last few hundred years, especially in, in, in the Western world, uh, commercial development, financial development, <coughs> market forces, broadly defined, would have played a much bigger uh, role in creating economic inequality. So the sources of inequality uh, change over time, but the, the end result tends to be the same, that in the absence of violent shocks, inequality would be either rising or fairly stable at relatively high levels. And in as much as these violent shocks make a difference, they really shape the overall distribution uh, of inequality in the very long run. We can track this. Uh, reasonably well, in fact, uh, especially in the case of Europe, because here we have not necessarily the most data, but certainly the most scholarship. And if you wanted to <coughs> see how inequality, economic inequality has changed in Europe over the last 9,000 years, that's pretty much what it looked like. Uh, agriculture appears in Europe for the first time about 9,000 years ago. People shift from being hunter-gatherers to being farmers. The more sedentary they become, the more states there are, the more inequality we can observe. We can observe this in the archaeological record where there are richer and richer graves of a few leaders, bigger houses, uh, that sort of thing. It culminates certainly in the Roman period. Romans rule 80% of all people in Europe. It's a massive, uh, exploitative, highly stratified empire with a super wealthy, very small ruling class and everybody else uh, much less well off. This goes on for hundreds of years. Eventually, state collapse, Roman Empire falls apart. Severe epidemic, first appearance of the Black Death uh, right afterwards. 
the combination of two sh these two shocks makes, uh, reduces the population, makes everybody less well off than before, uh, but really wipes out the wealth elite that had uh, dominated Europe during the Roman period. In the high middle ages, you get a phase of recovery, population growth, more cities, more commerce, more money, more material goods, pretty high levels of inequality where we have data, France, Italy, uh, England around 1300. Then the Black Death comes in, I will describe this phenomenon, uh, raising the value of labor, depressing returns on capital, poor less poor, richer less rich. And then the plague goes away, and from about 1500 to 1914, for about 400 years, almost everywhere where we have uh, statistical quantifiable data, you see a gradual increase in income and wealth inequality, a process that is then reversed after 1914 because of uh, the world wars and uh, the great communist revolutions. That lasts into the 1970s, 80s, depending on which country you're looking at. And now in the last few decades, uh, we have seen pretty much everywhere a reversal of this trend with rising um, inequality. We can perform a similar exercise in a more impressionistic fashion for uh, Latin America, going back only, in this case, 600 years. But there was already a great deal of inequality before the Europeans first showed up because there are uh, uh, hierarchical empires in place in Mexico, the Aztec, the Inca, in Peru. We do know uh, that the Spanish conquistadores were quite generous in appropriating uh, large uh, estates, enormous amounts of land, uh, tens of thousands of forced laborers, so it's quite clear that the economic inequality initially goes up in Latin America in the 16th century. Then you have the attenuating effects of population loss, which I talked about earlier. Uh, but then <coughs> as the uh, uh, indigenous population becomes more used uh, to old world diseases, under in a mature colonial uh, period, 18th century, Latin America is exceedingly uh, unequal. Uh, there's a small uh, ruling class that owns large plantations, there's slavery, and most of the population uh, lives in pretty dire conditions. Then you get violent disturbances, the wars of independence as a consequence of the Napoleonic Wars, that wherever we have data, there are many data sets, but the ones we have indicate inequality actually does go down in this period uh, in the early 19th century. And then from about 1860, 1870 onwards till about 2000, for well over a century, during the first age of uh, globalization, inequality everywhere in Latin America, everywhere we have data, uh, increases uh, pretty steadily. It was only <coughs> in the first decade of this century, between about 2002, 2010, that you see some uh, degree of peaceful uh, equalization in many Latin American countries for a number of very special reasons I'm happy to talk about uh, in discussion. But it see, it's not quite clear whether this uh, uh, process, which is like this little dip here at the very end, whether this process is actually uh, sustainable um, because of economic downturns, think Brazil, other Latin American countries. Um, it has already stalled uh, in many countries. We no longer see continuing uh, reductions in income inequality in many Latin American countries. It's simply too soon to tell whether uh, this is just a blip, whether there's a longer secular trend in peaceful equalization, or whether this is simply not sustainable. We just simply don't know at this point. Last example is the US. <coughs> in the colonial period, uh, thanks to benevolent British rule, uh, North America was not particularly uh, unequal, certainly far less unequal economically than the uh, uh, much more stratified societies of Europe. There's a further reduction of war of independence because rich loyalists would get kicked out or lose some of their assets. But ever since independence, <coughs> effectively up into the 1920s, uh, you have more or less steady increases in wealth and income inequality in the US a process only reversed by the Great Depression, and especially World War II, uh, into the 1970s, and then a very major reversal, uh, where by some metrics the US is today almost as unequal as it had been in 1929, which was the high, uh, the peak of inequality uh, uh, at the end of this uh, process here. You see very uh, similar kinds of wave-like uh, changes all over the world. We could draw similar charts uh, for China, for East Asia, where uh, the, the collapse of various dynasties would coincide with a reduction in inequality. 
and powerful mature dynasties would coincide with more inequality and so on. Um, so, the, of course, the question now is, well, assuming, granting for the sake of argument, this is all true, uh, everything I just told you is absolutely right, this is what history was like, what does this mean for the present and especially uh, the future? Now, it is well known that economic inequality by any number of measures has been rising in most virtually all uh, developed uh, countries now for a, a, a significant amount of time, several decades in many cases. It is also true that the traditionally effective equalizing mechanisms that I uh, explored over the long run of history are not currently active. And that's a very good thing. I don't think anybody in this room wants another world war. Very few people, maybe some, but few people want another Bolshevik uh, revolution. States in most parts of the world are much more resilient uh, than they used to be. You still have state collapse in Central, in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, but not really uh, anywhere else. There is, of course, always a risk of some massive epidemic event. There could be a big pandemic literally tomorrow, but we are much better equipped and will be much better equipped in the foreseeable future to deal with this because of advances in, in genetics in particular. And if there's going to be another world war, it's not going to be a mass mobilization war with tens of millions of people uh, serving in large armies. So these things are not very likely to happen anytime soon. So you have an interesting combination of increasing inequality and a retreat of these traditionally effective violent leveling mechanisms. There, are, there is no shortage, if you look at the literature, especially in economics, of uh, policy recommendations. People writing long books telling us uh, what to do, uh, how to address economic uh, inequality. Very famously, and it's certainly the, uh, the best of the pack, uh, Sir um, Atkinson, who unfortunately passed away uh, recently, working this out very carefully uh, for the UK, what would need to be done in order to re reduce uh, inequality, what the, the costs would be in terms of higher taxes, its impact on economic development, uh, and so on. It's a, in, in many cases in the US, it's much more indiscriminate. You get long laundry lists of all kinds of things that would, in theory, uh, work. Uh, fiscal intervention, more investment in education, tracking down offshore wealth, providing basic income, uh, political reform uh, to, to um, uh, prevent ma manipulations of the political process uh, to favor uh, very rich people, any number of things. And that's all well. The problem is that even though many of these things worked in the past, say 50, 60 years ago, we didn't really need recipes that would work in the world uh, today. They wouldn't just work in theory, that would actually have a chance of being implemented, that would be politically feasible in the world we inhabit uh, today, in an environment that's much more globalized, much more integrated uh, than it was in the past when some of these reforms did in fact uh, work, in an environment where uh, previous shock-induced equalization effects have begun to fade. Uh, all these war and post-war policies, high taxes, uh, state regulation of various uh, sectors of the uh, private eco economy, uh, all these things, a hiatus in globalization that lasted in some ways up to the 1970s, all these things have really begun uh, to fade. So the environment today is quite different from the way it was uh, a couple generations ago when we could observe uh, significant reductions in inequality. And at the same time, on top of everything else, there are currently multiple forces, um, active, uh, operational around the globe, that tend to have a disequalizing effect, that make it more likely that inequality will go up rather than down in the next 10, 20, uh, or 50 years. One is globalization, which of course is enormously beneficial to many people in developing countries, but uh, disadvantageous to certain uh, constituencies in developed countries, which we have uh, observed now for some time. Automation is an ongoing, completely open-ended process. Nobody knows what jobs are actually going to be done by robots, by software 10, 20, 50 uh, years from now. There's uh, certainly an enormous potential for destruction uh, of certain types of jobs. Retraining is an answer, but not a panacea, because you can't just retrain people uh, overnight. A lot of friction uh, is, is bound to occur as a part of this process. 
Another development that is really just beginning in rich countries is the aging uh, of the general uh, population, something you already see in Japan and Western Europe uh, in particular that is going to become much more widespread, we already know this, over the next generation or two. That's going to be a problem because the older uh, population of developed countries is going to be, the less uh, public funds will be available for aggressively redistributive programs because more money has to be spent on caring for the elderly, for pensions, health care, uh, all these things that are not intrinsically uh, redistributive. Now, of course, the flip side, and in fact, already studies uh, about Japan uh, 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 indicating that as inequality in Japan has begun uh, to go up, it has done so as a result of secular aging because Japan had to cut back on certain welfare provisions uh, for the elderly, and that's a process that's bound to continue in the future. Now, the flip side of secular aging is, of course, immigration. The idea being, well, if there are uh, more and more elderly people and enough young people, uh, we'll just have more um, people come in from other parts of the world. In the case of Europe, it would have to be the Middle East, it would have to be uh, Africa. Well, that in turn creates new challenges with respect um, to um, um, inequality, something we haven't really quite seen yet because the process is only really just uh, beginning on a large scale, but there are lots of surveys being done where you try and, and you sort of figure out uh, how people would say they would respond. Uh, would they still be willing uh, to pay very high taxes if the beneficiaries, the recipients uh, of these taxes are people who are ethnically, culturally, religiously very different uh, from themselves? And the answer is generally not really. So we might expect rising resistance uh, to very highly redistributive welfare states uh, in the future as the ethnic composition of country changes dramatically so that Europe shifts more in the direction of the situation you have in the US. And it's long been argued that there is uh, greater resistance to redistribution in the US in part because the US has always been more diverse, more heterogeneous uh, than European uh, nation states and it has a dampening effect on uh, political will uh, uh, to engage in redistribution. And of course the final frontier, which is still science fiction, but maybe not for much longer, is that so far we have been talking about inequality between people, right? We are still all homo sapiens, but once you uh, get into the business of genetic enhancement through gene editing, which you can already do, or cybernetic implants that will benefit some people uh, more than others, people who, who can afford uh, to have these procedures done on themselves, on their children, once this uh, gets going, and there are 200 countries in the world, not all of these countries are going to outlaw uh, these uh, techniques as they become uh, available, that has enormous potential for future disequalization because you may actually end up with a situation where some people are you know, physically different from others, cognitively, uh, in terms of their health, in terms of their capabilities, uh, superior, for want of a better word, uh, to others, and that would create inequalities we can't even imagine uh, potentially at this point. And of course, all these uh, factors all push sort of in the same direction. So we are in a very interesting environment where uh, you have these disequalizing forces at work. The traditionally effective violent shocks have gone away, at least for the time being. So it's really very hard to see any kind of potential for significant peaceful uh, equalization uh, in the foreseeable uh, future unless something happens that has never happened before. Now, of course, it's important to realize that history doesn't determine the future, right? History can only show what happened in the past and can give us an idea of which things are easy to do and what things are really difficult to do. And I think what this survey does is, at the very least, it gives us an idea of just how hard it is to address economic inequality in the absence of these violent shocks. And that's the situation that we find ourselves in uh, right now. So I guess that's all I have to say, and I would uh, uh, welcome your questions. Thank you very much. So, so we have uh, a time for discussion and questions. I see hands up already. Um, I have a, a gentleman here in the blue uh, jumper. If you could say your name, where you're from, and, and keep your question as a question, that would be fantastic. We're going to take three questions together so that we can allow
uh, water to respond. So um, there was a question here, there was a, a question here in the grey shirt and, and one at the front in the blue shirt. So we'll take those three and then we'll move forward. I've got Good evening, very interesting speech. And uh, my name is Luca, I'm coming from Italy. So um, basically, um, due to the fact that I keep following the what what's happening in my country, um, in terms of inequality, I think that the major force that basically drive inequality is the justice system. Because uh, uh, I saw from um, a political side, even an economic side, that basically when in a country where there is a justice system that is not equal, that basically doesn't punish who does crime, and uh, so basically everyone is entitled to basically breach the rules, that's uh, the major uh, driver for inequality. And so uh, I think that uh, all in your speech has been quite meaningful, but I think even nowadays, uh, one of the reasons of inequality is uh, if the justice system is efficient or not. Um, Richard from London. Um, could you say why um, they need to be short-term, dramatic and intense shocks? Um, I'm thinking particularly about um, widespread low-level disorder and violence in England in the 18th century and early 19th century that obviously didn't, as you say, have much impact because in inequality went up during that period. So why do they have to be short-term and intense shocks? Thank you. Um, I'm Paul Segal. I'm down here. Right. Hi there. I'm a visiting fellow at the uh, International Inequalities Institute here. I apologize, mine is not a question but a challenge, which I hope is also interesting. So I'd like to make the case for the capacity for states to reduce inequality, uh, at least under the right uh, conditions of civil society. So um, uh, my, my, I work particularly on Latin America, and I disagree with your uh, the picture you have of inequality in Latin America. I think that's uh, incorrect, um, in the 20th century at least. Um, firstly, we don't have much data, so we can't, be, yeah. we can't be sure anyway, but the countries I know reasonably well are Mexico and Argentina. I'm currently working on Mexico, and it's pretty clear to us that um, when you look carefully at the data, there's a significant decline in inequality in the mid-20th century. Um, and uh, Argentina, which has top income data, the top 1% share declines a lot around the same period, around kind of 1940s, 1950s, and stays low uh, for quite a few decades then. So r similar in profile to the European countries. Um, both those countries uh, had a lot of a very active civil society, and not just civil society, but trade unions and agrarian organizations that were then incorporated into the state. So to me, that's state-led, well, sorry, not state-led, that's state-created decline in inequality supported by civil society, um, or kind of mobilization, if you like. Uh, social mobilization. Uh, jumping to the present, you see something comparable. Uh, you mentioned the decline in inequality in Latin America, but I think you understated it. It's pretty huge. So in a lot of these countries, we're talking about 10 or 12 Gini points, which is quite comparable to the decline in inequality in the rich countries after the Second World War. And uh, the countries where it was most dramatic since the early 2000s were Argentina, Bolivia, and Ecuador. Again, countries with a very strong kind of social mobilization and governments that were supported by that social mobilization. It might not last, as you say, but at least it, it, it occurred. We have measured it, and, and it might last. So, you know, does that challenge your thesis? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so I should say, um, I think it's, it's, we will have to investigate the kind of thing that you mentioned much more systematically, right? I mean, there are many different variables that you could correlate with measures of economic inequality, for instance, and what you pointed out would be one of them, right? I mean, how the justice system works, so that's just uh, a one of many ways of, of trying to enrich our understanding what the, not necessarily the causal factors that drive inequalities are, but, you know, what, what the overall uh, correlations are. So I think that's, that's a good point. Um, I'm not sure why they have to be short and dramatic. It just uh, turns out that they, they were, right? There is, as I said, there, was an there has always been an enormous amount of warfare and violence in, in history between states, within societies, and so on. And for the most part, uh, this would not, uh, did not generate any tangible improvements that we could see. I should say that the farther you go back in time, the poorer your, your vision is, so to speak. You wouldn't really be able to see something moderate because you couldn't be sure whether it's a real phenomenon or it's just bad evidence. So we tend to see 
the most dramatic changes because they're the ones that are securely uh, documented. So I can't rule out, obviously, there were some, some improvements out there uh, uh, to a certain degree. But uh, in as much as we look at, if, uh, whenever we look at really substantial um, um, changes, they're the ones that really seem to require, for one, it's a very strong word, require, but they really seem to require uh, some kind of really profound shock that cannot be uh, offset by uh, the people who, who uphold or benefit from the established order. And that is something that really comes to the fore with modernization, you could say, right? Where for the first time you have more cohesive nation states, where people have more sort of integrated uh, into society overall. So it's not by accident that this is uh, something that comes to the fore, especially in the 20th century. Uh, as for Latin America, I think uh, let, uh, that's, uh, that was biggest, I mean, this my biggest, I'm not concerned, but my biggest counterexample. I have a long section on this in my book because I think Latin America is, is really. Um, important and maybe even a source of hope, uh, in a sense, in that respect. Now, of course, you could be a little cynical and say, well, what happened in many Latin American countries was that you went from extremely high levels of inequality to very high levels of inequality. That's an improvement, right? But it's where this is a model uh, to be a bit parochial for, say, European and North American countries is an open question because there is undeniably a lot of low-hanging fruit in Latin American countries, right? You don't have to totally change everything if you just uh, target your fiscal measures a little better and you have a little more better education, redistribution programs and so on. That is bound to have a, a real effect, right? Um, and that is something we have seen. There are, I think, windfall effects. The commodities boom are uh, driven by China that uh, benefited non-urban workers disproportionately. There were certain other things coming into the uh, equation to make everything uh, more complex. This is why I think uh, what's happening right now is so frustrating because we are just too close to this to really see whether this is the first act of an ongoing process that's going to continue this decade, next decade, in, in, in the way uh, we see it in, 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 we saw it in the first half of the 20th century in other countries, or whether this will somehow turn into some kind of blip, which will be very unfortunate, right? I think, I mean, I don't know if you agree, but I think it's at this point sort of too soon to be really, to be either very optimistic or very pessimistic because the jury is still out uh, in a sense. So we are in the midst of this, but I find it, I find it um, absolutely fascinating. So I, I do uh, agree with this. And as for the historical data, sure. I mean, you have, this is, <laughs> this is a major compression story, right? I have little blips here. Uh, you know, there are decades, certainly, already at the beginning of the 20th century, then in the, in the, in the post-war period, uh, in some cases in the 70s or so, when individual countries, uh, you have uh, noticeable improvements in, in, in uh, income and wealth concentration. But the overall trend then, ultimately, especially if you weigh it for population, and you look at very populous countries like Brazil, they sort of drag up uh, other mean quite considerably. Um, the, the overall trend, once you iron out all these you know, fluctuations from decade to decade, seems to be, as far as I can tell, it seems to have been upwards. But again, this really changed after 2000, right? And you have a broad uh, change in the following decade. And that's certainly something uh, very much worth uh, watching. So I fully agree with that. Uh, Okay, there's a, the, um, the, the grey jumper just there, and then the gentleman in front, and then a yellow shirt up top. Hello, thank you very much for your very thought-provoking uh, talk. I, 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 I'm interested in the subject of plagues, because you say we're not likely to have any more in the future. Um, and, uh, but you brought in secular ageing as well. Um, and I was just wondering, in a closed society where you have limits to migration, could um, the aging population, uh, vast numbers of people literally falling off a cliff, dying, um, be sort of in, a, in some ways similar to the idea of a plague on, on, on wages in that society? And, uh, and my second point was to do with um, your optimism about medicine, um, be just because a lot of people are predicting um, that antibiotic resistance is going to be a huge problem in the future. Um, so any <coughs> thoughts on that? Mm. Thank you. Thank you for the really thought-provoking talk. Um, what I'm curious about is uh, the, the role of the colonial context in the world wars. So uh, it seemed to me that you had no uh, data from wor or world system theory or other theories we we'll call like the periphery. Um, 
I mean, I know that there isn't much data because uh, Imperial Palace had other things to do than collect data during their times, but um, I think it would be really interesting to see how inequality evolved in the colonial context during the war because I can imagine that there were really different developments. Um, I know from the uh, sources I, I looked into in uh, British India um, that the British were really keen on collecting uh, war taxes in, uh, in poor rural communities and that the uh, that the inequality, not the inequality, but the um, the uh, economic developments in India during the war were one of the mo one of the main uh, processes which affected decolonization and the m m mass mobilization of anti-colonial protests, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think it would be quite a valuable uh, topic of like inquiry in this context. Thanks. Always wear a yellow shirt if you want to ask a question in a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wasn't wearing it. You wouldn't have seen me. So. Uh, Centenary of the First World War, end of the First World War starts is next year, obviously. Um, and I was just thinking a, a, use for, a useful use for history would be to look back and uncover some of the social solidarity issues you talked about and maybe link them to other inequalities or reduction inequalities such as gender inequality and reduction of economic inequality. Uh, the housing, uh, booming housing, ho homes for heroes, and all that sort of stuff. And a lot of that isn't known, or it's been lost. And history is one of the things which could play a role in changing the debate nowadays. Um, I would hope so, because otherwise I wouldn't have written the book, right? I mean, there's at least a hope that history has something to contribute. Not Like I said, it doesn't predict the future, but it tells us something. We have to figure out what it is. Um, as for the colonial aspect, it's true, of course, that the data aren't great. But work has been done, especially um, by, by Atkinson and his associates. Um, what we see in, in those cases where there are data, it's really quite striking that you have uh, for top income shares a great compression in India during World War II. I'm not sure anybody really fully understands why it is, but it certainly fits the overall pattern. Uh, Mauritius is very well attested um, because the data are good and you see the same effect there. Uh, in fact, that one country where you don't have is Argentina, right? In Argentina, the rich get richer during World War II because they sell uh, meat to uh, Britain. And the people who own all the herds are becoming even richer than before. And then you have the backlash in the 50s with Peron and so on. So there's a delayed effect. Uh, that's actually the one uh, count that ex exception that proves the rule in a way because it's really uh, removed from this. Uh, and I guess there's still, like I said, work to be done and, and stuff to be unearthed. I think, in general, very broadly speaking, decolonization does go hand in hand with attenuation of inequality, even though, I mean, individual countries, it's all over the place, but uh, overall is a trend. Um, that's, again, not perhaps terribly surprising, but again, worth studying in greater detail. And um, as for uh, the plague, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's true. In fact, a related question is sometimes people say, well, what about climate change, right? I mean, you talk about war and revolution. So, and climate change has the uh, potential, if you uh, follow the, the worst case scenarios over the next, whatever, 50, 100 years, has the potential of renewing all these things. You could have wars. The Syrian civil war is a good example, already driven by long term drought to some extent, what happens in Yemen, sort of thing. Um, it could precipitate uh, new diseases, right? Because, again, climatic reasons, uh, state collapse, and so on. Um, it wouldn't be an independent factor because it would operate through one or more of these four that I identified, but it might actually bring about some kind of revival that is surely um, undesirable. As for having an actual plague or widespread um, antibiotic failure in, in developed countries, the problem here is that we don't really know, we can't know from experience and I'm not aware of anybody having tried to simulate or model this, what the effect in a, in, a, in, a, in a high income society would be of losing a large chunk of the population. In an agrarian setting, it's really very straightforward. In a, in a more complex industrial, post-industrial society, the effects are, I think, very hard to predict in any meaningful way, right? And it would obviously be very, very, uh, very disruptive but when it would also be equalizing at the same time, that's not at all clear to me. So it may well be that this particular force has run its course, and if it comes back again, it may well not have the same effect that it used to have in, in the pre-industrial period. Great, so uh, lots of questions. I'm gonna try and, the gentleman at the front here, then um, 
on, can you come to the front, th uh, fourth row back in the, in the middle, <coughs> and then uh, far side black uh, jumper up top. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for an inter interesting, you know, a bit pessimistic talk. So, and I wonder, um, maybe inequality is better than the alternative. And could one imagine a kind of society where, e and with, with huge inequality, but where even the least advantage uh, could live decent lives? Or would inequality in itself drive uh, brutalization, repression? Uh, or maybe uh, the brave new life, brave new world is an alternative. Oh yeah, so hi, my name is Ujwal and I'm from America. My question is, can violent shocks have the opposite effect of increasing inequality, especially if it's, for example, country X taking over country Y during a war, leading to country Y becoming second class citizens in country X? And at the same time, given inequality, given violence is only a short term stopgap and we see inequality again rising back up after periods of violence, is there truly any way to have a lasting negative impact on inequality to reduce it? Is that possible? Hi, uh, my name is Jonah and I have two questions, but they're quick. Uh, what are your thoughts on artificial intelligence and machine learning and the uh, economic effects on uh, on equality and both baseline and welfare. And second is about what about the development of cryptocurrencies, which is a movement to get out of uh, fiat based currencies, which are manipulated by the governments. And how does that, do you think that pan out for uh, uh, both equality and baseline? Um, I must admit, I haven't thought about that. I mean, the very last point, but that's, that's an interesting one. I uh, would obviously have to be a more widespread phenomenon than it is now, but if you think we're just at the beginning of this. That's worth thinking about. As for uh, AI, I guess the argument, the economists always say, well, everybody will be better off because we get rid of the horrible job and we will have better jobs, just like it happened 200 years ago. But that is, at the very least, unlikely to be a very smooth process. And in the end, someone's going to own the robots too, right? So even if it delivers certain benefits, it can still lead to an even higher concentration uh, of material um, inequality. As for, well, your question, that's a question that <laughs> often comes up. One could certainly argue that poverty alleviation is, is more important in a fundamental sense than addressing purely distributional issues, right? Um, so for instance, if you take the development of China or the last generation, where in the 80s, everybody was equally poor, crudely speaking, and now hundreds of millions of people have middle-class incomes and there is twice as much inequality as before. What is the more desirable scenario? I would imagine most people would say the one we have, and not the one that existed in the past. So, um, and we talked about this, in fact, before we came here. Um, there's really, we are only really beginning to study very systematically what the relationship is between poverty and inequality as such. Is there, is there a meaningful connection? Can you fully, um, you know, separate them? Could you have a system where um, objective absolute levels of inequality keep going down while relative inequality goes up? That's perfectly possible. Again, we need, I think, more and more systematic uh, investigations of this. And then ultimately it becomes a, let's say philosophical, but a political or ethical issue, right? To say, should that be enough? as long as we can guarantee that people don't fall through the safety net and even the least uh, uh, advantaged are a little better off than they were last year, let's say. Is that good enough? Or is there a, a broader responsibility in a, in a nation state or in a democratic system of making sure that whatever gains are being generated that they are not too unevenly distributed even if uh, poverty itself is being properly addressed? That's, that's a, a very open-ended kind of issue, but certainly one that we will talk, we'll have to talk more about as, as a society uh, in the future. Uh, as, a, as for your question, um, so let me, so the question was, why it could have the inverse, so violence could have an, the opposite effect. I mean, it does, I mean, that's why I, I put in the example of the civil wars, right? I mean, if, if it happens in, outside the context of states that already have pretty, 
uh, you know, stable institutions and participatory uh, arrangements in place, um, the net result may well be to exacerbate rather than um, alleviate problems. And as, as you say, I mean, especially once it, it, it forces people to go on the move and so on, it could certainly have that effect, at least in the short term. That's, that's certainly true. So that's why we can't just say, oh, violence solves the problem. It's a very super specific type of violent event. Uh, historically speaking, that has had the effect, and I think we can understand pretty well why. And most didn't have, and even today or in the future won't have. I think that's fair to say. Okay, so uh, there was a white, um, blue and white shirt uh, there, uh, white and blue jumper, kind of. <laughs> Uh, and then after that, I, I know I, I'm picking randomly, so forgive me, but th we haven't had one from the very back. So there's someone that the, the, the kind of final, final back, we'll, we'll grab that person. This may be the last round uh, of questions, but hopefully we'll have some time for more. So I, for the others that we don't get to, I, I sincerely apologize. But uh, um, yes, here, and then we'll work around. Great, thank you. Um, my name is Apollinaire, and uh, I'm from Belgium, and I live and, and work here in London. Um, my question for you is about uh, universal uh, revenue, which is very debated now in, in France and other countries. Is that something you think that would be a solution against the inequality? Um, Sorry, I missed the word. Did you say religion? Or what is it? Universal revenue. The universal revenue? So like a universal oh, I'm sorry. No, basic yes, yes, income. Of course. Yes, 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 yes. I was, yeah. Yes. So this is yes, a new right. concept which is debated in, in yes, Europe yes, of um, because of this um, automation and other things. Yeah. So people are thinking is maybe that would be a solution mm -hmm. for the automation coming and other stuff. So but my last question would be about um, uh, the concept of inequality, which is really a vague concept, right? So. What do we really need? Is it a, a, a society where we have a justice system which provides the equal chance of people to compete and realize their, their, their ambition, for example, instead of focusing on the difference of revenue between people and stuff? Yeah. Um, hello, uh, I'm Javier, I'm from Spain. And my question would be, um, so the social policy measures, you mentioned them at, uh, on your last sli slide, but I was felt them missing in the first part um, when you were addressing the different options to reduce inequality, the different causes. And I think Sweden poses this example because Sweden had not a uh, violent um, history during the 20th century, and Sweden went through uh, w um, from a very unequal um, country to a very equal country and that was basically thanks to social policies such as uh, universal education, universal healthcare, unemployment benefits, etc. Et et so wouldn't the social, uh, the case of Sweden contradict your theory? Uh, what would you say to that? Yeah, and on my side, uh, my name is Antoine, I'm, I'm from France, I live here in London. Uh, and it's actually a mix of those two questions uh, and trying to focus on the positive correlation between economic growth and the decline in inequalities. Uh, so my first question was actually, in your, um, in your research, if you've seen in the past 30 years that are more relevant today because to put things into context, as you said, thinking about globalization, automation, uh, if you've seen a country in the developed world where we could see economic growth and at least not a rise in inequalities, uh, in inequality, and the second question was uh, about the, not just the universal income, but the, the minimum wage. If you think those type of economic programs can um, revive, uh, I mean, number one, wage inflation, and as a consequence, uh, kind of revive the middle class uh, that then can be beneficial to uh, economic growth and everyone. Or if it's just something that was the case in uh, kind of the 30 uh, glorious years after World War II. Thank you. Uh, let me start with a historical question. Um, I had to address Latin America and I had to address Sweden because everybody said, what about Sweden? That was actually a very popular question uh, when I was working on the book. And Scandinavia is really striking because we now think of Scandinavians being these egalitarian people. And 200 years ago, uh, Scandinavian countries were phenomenally unequal, Denmark, Norway, and so on. Uh, 
Um, and in some cases, you could say, okay, well, it's World War II occupation, Norway, Denmark, Finland is very heavily involved in the war. Sweden wasn't. Sweden was technically neutral. Kind of wasn't. I mean, in World War I, it decided more with the Axis powers and had a, a big fallout when Germany effectively collapsed and you had the Russian Revolution next door and there were all kinds of disturbances already in the 1920s as a result of this, uh, uh, really uh, boosting the, the social socialists for the, for the first time. And then the World War I actually really made sure to get into this. I have a whole section on this in my book. Um, the experience of Sweden in World War II is not that terribly different from the experience of other European countries because they are fully surrounded by um, Germans and their allies. There's full mobilization, an uh, enormously high percentage of all people in Sweden serve in the military throughout World War II because they have every day there could be an invasion by Germany. There could be an allied invasion to you know, outflank uh, Germany. Um, uh, there is a massive state intervention in the economy, a planned economy effectively, very uh, enormous uh, increase. Let's see if I have this. Ha ha, see what about Sweden? <laughs> I, anticipated, <laughs> I anticipated your question. See what happens in Sweden? In Sweden, you have the same, I, I showed you this chart earlier for uh, Western countries in general. In Sweden, what happens uh, for uh, uh, incomes? Well, incomes go through the roof here. What happens here? This is the 19, late 1930s and early 1940s. All of a sudden, the Swedish government says, a co uh, concentration government, all the parties said, well, we have to do this, right? We have to, uh, uh, we, we have, to have a war industry. They built their war industry overnight because they were cut off from imports. That's why they're still a successful British army, uh, Swedish arms industry. It was built in this period. Uh, conscription, rationing, effectively a planned economy for quite a long time. And then after the war, the decision was, well, are we going, the conservatives said, are we going to cut back again? And the social democrats said, are we going to keep this up and use those funds for social welfare? And they carried the day. So the electorate was on the side of the, uh, uh, the proponents of the, of the expanded welfare state. But the war acted, in a sense, as a catalyst. I think it's very important to distinguish. I'm not saying that the war itself causes all kinds of things that would never have happened in any way otherwise. What it does is it has a catalytic function where it hugely accelerates sort of uh, uh, processes that were already underway in a much more gradual way, amplifies them, compresses them in time, creates these you know, spikes you wouldn't otherwise get. And then if you look at the overall statistics, accounts for this dramatic change in a relatively short period of time. Um, and it's something that I also do in the book, I look at counterfactuals, right? I say, well, what would have happened if there had never been a big war in the 20th century, right? No World War I, hence there would not have been Lenin either. No Lenin, no Mao, no nothing, no Cold War, nothing like this would have happened. How would that have affected inequality? Would inequality have gone down anyway because of you know, uh, economic development, uh, better education for more people, more democratization, unions, all these things were already happening anyway, right? Just it might have happened much more gradually. And it's worth thinking about, and Sweden is a good example for this. Uh, also, so I mean, it's it's everything is, is is more complex in a way, but I think you can actually make a pretty good case. That even the Swedish case, and in the Swiss case too, although less so, um, uh, you can see very tangible effects of that. Not being, you know, responsible for what happens at exclusion or anything else, but really n nudging is too weak a word. Pushing uh, uh, trains that were already there. Uh, in, in a certain direction, amplifying and accelerating them. And that can certainly be well established uh, for Sweden. As for the basic income, I think a very short answer is that if you implement a basic income that is politically feasible and easily affordable, it's not going to make a big difference because many uh, Western countries already have, if you, if you lump together all the various benefits, you already have almost like a basic income universal income anyway, right? If you want that universal income, it makes a real difference. That's going to be very expensive and politically unfeasible, arguably, in the world we currently inhabit, right? So I think you have ideal, typically, uh, two options. One is to go for a more timid version that's not going to make a big difference. And you go for an aggressive version that might make a difference but it's not going to actually happen. So <laughs> that's, that seems to be, my, that is my, my understanding of this. But again, this is something that has really just uh, 
begun to be debated more seriously in, in recent years. So we'll see what, what people will come up with on, on that front. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Scheidel. Join me in, in thanking him again. Thank